good. Here we go. So um, I want you in the course of the next hour, and then we'll answer your questions. In the course of the next hour, I want you to understand a little bit about the brief history of cannabis in the United States. We have a long and illustrious history of cannabis in the United States. And I'll start off by saying I don't call it marijuana. Uh, I don't spell uh, cannabis with an M, you might say. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Marijuana was a term that was used to demonize a ethnic population coming from Mexico as they were escaping civil wars in Mexico. And the government used that terminology to demonize the herb that they were bringing across with them and to, de and to demonize Hispanics. So I do not like the word marijuana. I don't use it. Um, I'll refer to it if it's, I'm referring to someone else referring it to it. But I really like to have some precision uh, with the use of the terminology. And so I, I want to talk about cannabis. And, and there are medical marijuana laws and those sorts of things. But for all intents and purposes, I, I prefer the, the term cannabis. I want you to understand what medical cannabis is. I want you to recount the evidence for the therapeutic benefits and risks of cannabis. Know the current legal architecture of medical cannabis in the United States, which is very confusing. And I'll mention for us who are on, in Minnesota that as of January 1st, some new laws uh, changed and um, uh, we have increasing access both through the medical, medical marijuana laws that we have here, but also through um, uh, over-the-counter sale of CBD. So I'll be able to, by the end of this, you should be able to understand, is THC legal or illegal? Is CBD legal? It's so confusing. I'll try to make some sense of that so you can all can understand when grandma shows up uh, at the holiday party and says, honey, can I use this CBD I just bought down the street? So you should be able to inform that particular discussion. And then really, I want to talk about the Minnesota Medical Cannabis Program. The Minnesota, Med I don't have any conflicts of interest. They don't give me money. I'm not a paid speaker or anything. I mean, they're a state-run department. They're a health department. They don't have any money anyway. But, um, but, but so they don't give me any of uh, that. And I just want you to understand because actually the Minnesota Medical Cannabis Program is a very well-structured program that many other states have used uh, to develop other state cannabis programs. I don't have any financial disclosure. So I want you to know, and I want you to be aware, and many of you are aware, um, that hemp production uh, was encouraged in the US colonies and that hemp is actually uh, a very fibrous form of cannabis. So the two main strains that you're aware of when you talk about cannabis are cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. I've got pictures of them, I'll show you. Um, but hemp is actually a cannabis family member if you will. And that family member has a lot of fiber in it. Um, and so that's because of that, it was, ro it was used for ropes, fabrics, fiber. Arts. And that's relevant today because that's why CBD is technically legal under the Trump administration. Okay, that's why you see this rapid mass expansion of CBD shops everywhere because it was made legal when Trump signed the Farm Bill Act in 2018. Now there is some dispute about this, but as we understand it, it was made legal with certain requirements. So I'll talk about those requirements. So cannabis was listed in the United States Pharmacopeia from 1850 to 1942. Um, and it, there is labor. And, and actually what's interesting about the indications is if you look at other than labor pain, nausea and rheumatism were two indications which are two of the three leading indications that show that it today, as of like two years ago, has the best efficacy. So what we know, what's, what's old is new, uh, really, in cannabis, which is kind of interesting. So uh, as we look at cannabis, you know, everybody sort of facetiously said, you know, the cannabis today is not your grandma's cannabis. What they're really talking about is horticultural techniques. I think what's interesting and problematic about the whole issue of cannabis is that Cannabis public policy has gotten so far ahead of scientific knowledge that it will collapse in on itself and become the next public health disaster. It's just, mark my words here tonight, cannabis is your next public health disaster if it's not already. So what do we do about it? How do we think about it? We need to understand it. You gotta understand what's going on. Um, 
But in the 1970s, we had low potency cannabis, and then they started to figure out with advanced horticultural techniques, you can actually breed in THC. I'll talk about cannabis here in a second, but THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, is actually the psychoactive part of the, of the plant uh, that gets people high. So people want to get high and people want to use cannabis to get high. So what do they do? They breed plants to breed in more THC, which is really a fundamental uh, mistake. If you think about it from a, I mean, being high is, has no therapeutic benefit except you're just high. It doesn't actually have perhaps any healing properties other than the treatment of pain, arguably, but I'll talk about that in a second. And then when you saw in the 2000s, higher potency with selective strains, with the, the problem with breeding in THC is you breed in THC, you necessarily breed out CBD. And CBD may actually have more health benefits than THC. So up until recently, we used to really uh, talk about cannabis strains as being cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. Now, cannabis sativa has more THC and cannabis indica has more CBD. And so that's why they used to say cannabis sativa was a mind high and cannabis indica was a body high. That's completely irrelevant today. So, and the reason it's irrelevant is because horticultural techniques in the cannabis world have advanced so much that you basically have chemotypes, which are basically crossbred strains of these two. And there's three chemotypes. Chemotype one is the ratio of THC to CBD is greater than one. Chemotype two is the THC CBD ratio is equal to one. And chemotype three is a THC CBD ratio is less than one. So it gives you an idea as to the strain that people are making or developing or extracting or purifying and that we don't talk about this, the plants anymore, we talk about really chemotypes. And because now that we understand why THC and CBD might be differentially relevant, you can really just sort of focus on what is it you're trying to produce and we can sort of drop the nomenclature of the plant. So let's talk about can cannabinoids for a second. So um, I, I, I'm, a, I'm an addiction specialist, so I'm always intrigued by drugs, um, as you would suspect. But what intrigues me about drugs is that when we think about the brain, the brain is an amazing, amazing gift. It makes, it, and there are no neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are the signaling chemicals in the brain. There are no neurotransmitters that we don't have receptors for. And there are no receptors for which we don't have a neurotransmitter. And that all the things that we do as a human being, procreating and eating and sleeping, we get rewarded for through the release of dopamine. Okay, and dopamine uh, is a re it's, is in the nucleus accumbens center. So when dopamine is released, we get reinforcement, and so we make our own cannabinoids. We we and I'll talk about that. We actually make our own morphine. We actually make everything. The brain is a self-contained reinforcement apparatus. What fascinates me about addiction is that something goes wrong in our development or you know, upbringing or we have trauma. And then for some reason, we need something outside like a drug to get through life. I, I find that tragic. I also find it very intriguing at the same time. And cannabis is no different. And when we talk about phytocannabinoids, these are essentially plant type substances that interact with a receptor that we have in our brain for which we already make a neurotransmitter. Because you probably had clever people in high school who said, if God didn't want me to get high, dude, he would not have given me uh, THC receptors in my brain. And that was true up until 1992, and I'll show you that. But a phytocannabinoid, is made by the plant and it interacts with a receptor in a brain um, uh, that actually responds to that. So one may ask, why does the plant make cannabinoids? So the plant didn't make cannabinoids so that we could get high. I mean, that's just a ridiculous argument. It's the same ridiculous argument that God wanted us to smoke tobacco. That's why he made a nicotine receptor in our brain. Another ridiculous argument. Tobacco plant makes nicotine because it's an insecticide and it kills bugs, so the bugs don't eat the leaf. It just so happens that nicotine looks exactly like another neurotransmitter we made, 
which is called acetylcholine. And that's why get, people get addicted to tobacco and die from it because they can't, because that overtakes the brain. It hijacks the circuitry. The cannabis plant makes a cannabinoid because the cannabis plant grows ideally in, in, in very bright, lots of sun exposed areas, which makes the plant susceptible to ultraviolet damage. And that ultraviolet damage um, can actually cause damage to the plant like it causes skin cancer on human beings. We're both plants and animals are very sensitive to ultraviolet radiation. So the plant makes the cannabinoid to absorb UV light. And it's interesting when you actually look at chemistry, basic chemistry, phytocannabinoids are optimally designed to absorb UV light and then those, they, they absorb the energy and the molecules transform. So that's why it makes it, okay? It just so happens it looks like a chemical. And there's like 104 of these things in the plant. Um, and three, we only know a little bit about three of them. One is THC, the one that gets you high. Uh, and, um, and that also has probably some analgesic properties and perhaps some anti-inflammatory properties. There's cannabidiol or CBD. Um, and what's interesting and important about cannabidiol is that CBD probably offsets the psychoactivity of THC. And when people smoke a lot of marijuana, they become incredibly paranoid um, over time. And that's one of the ad potential adverse events. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But if you have a, if you're actually any, especially substances that are high in THC, you will develop anxiety and paranoia. End of story. Um, but the CBD seems to moderate that. So if you have a blended, if you have a product that people are using that's blended in a one-to-one -one ratio, like a chemotype two in a THC CBD, they're less likely to have the paranoia and the depression because it seems like that CBD is offsetting that psychoactivity. They did, there was a very interesting program where they looked at cannabis bred in the UK and they bred these plants called skunk. And skunk was very high in THC, and so therefore very low in CBD. And they had people smoke skunk uh, cannabis or regular cannabis. And in human studies, in a short-term three to four-hour trial, they saw increased paranoia, increased anxiety, uh, much significantly higher in the skunk group than in the non-skunk group. So very good evidence that high THC makes you paranoid. Um, and, and so I think that's important to remember. So that CBD blend is important. And then there's cannabinol, and there's about 101 you know, one other ones. But we don't really know much about those, and we don't really know what the pharmacologic or pharmacodynamic effects are. So getting back to the, if God didn't want me to smoke pot, dude, why did he give me a THC receptor? That was true and clever up until 1992. Then at Hebrew University, they discovered that our brain makes its own cannabinoid, and it's called anandamide. You know, a receptor neurotransmitter is like a lock and key, if you remember from chemistry. Um, and this is the key. And anandamide seems to be um, associated uh, with uh, utility in the suppression of painful memories. And when you think about it, the amount of brain, uh, the amount of anandamide your brain needs to make um, is orders of magnitude smaller than the amount of THC that people get during a typical drug use experience. It's the reason why people forget things when they smoke pot. Your body doesn't need that much THC. It doesn't need to forget that much, uh, but it helps with suppression of painful memories. There are two main receptors for CBD, uh, or, or sorry, for uh, cannab uh, cannabinoids. And one is CB1, which is predominantly in the central nervous system. And then there's CB2. Uh, which is in the peripheral nervous system and probably has some immune function modulation. And why does it work? It works because if you look, there's molecular mimicry. The anandamide molecule um, looks very much like the THC molecule. So when people exogenously consume THC, they actually act on the cannabis receptor and they get, the, they, they, they get an effect acting on the CB1 receptor. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on receptors. But I'm going to tell you that it's interesting and important to know that the location of the receptor has everything to do with its potential effect. And it, because CB1 is located on the presynaptic membrane, it helps with nerve propagation and nerve signal suppression, which may be the agonism that you see there as it suppresses nerve transmission as it goes down the, um, uh, the axon. 
Um, so, so that's important to know. And the, and the other thing that's amazing about the brain is it's not just about the number of neuroreceptors that you have and the number of receptors are the same, um, but also just like in real estate, it's location, location, location. That is the location of a, of a particular receptor has everything to do with the effect that the receptor has on neurophysiology. So uh, when you think about dopamine, which I mentioned before is released in the nucleus accumbens, which is the deep part of the brain, when, that, when dopamine is released in the nucleus accumbens, it, it results in reward activity. It results in reinforcement activity. It makes you wanna do that thing again. And, and then, but in, in the prefrontal cortex where we, where we appreciate love and beauty and art, dopamine receptors actually improve it attention. So it's not reinforcement, it's attention. Um, so that's why when people use nicotine or use other substances, they have different effects. The nicotine's rewarding them when they use tobacco, and then the nicotine focuses them, and that's why they justify continued use, although it's probably more related to addiction. As related to cannabinoids, where the cannabinoid CB1 receptor is interacting with the THC, uh, you can see that that particular locational brain structure has a particular neurophysiologic output. It's the same receptor in different locations having different neurophysiologic responses, okay? It's, I think it's quite amazing stuff when you think about it. Uh, and so we see these effects in, 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 in on can with cannabis. You see the euphoria, the rapid heart rate, the dry mouth, the paranoia, anxiety, vomiting. You see, the, and then the cognitive impairment uh, as we think about these things. So, so let's talk a little bit, a little bit about um, you know cannabis delivery. Um, you know, in, in addiction, we, we think we try to at least I try to simplify things a little bit, right? So, I talk about final common pathways. The final common pathway in addiction is that cannabis and alcohol and cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine, final common pathway is the release of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, which makes you want to do, do the behavior again, okay? What's interesting and fascinating and important about that is that the reason why those areas in your brain developed teleologically was so that you would have sex to, 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 to propagate the species and do, want to do that behavior again, that same area of the brain lights up when you have sex as when you shoot or snort meth, okay? It's, we're not that complex. We're incredibly complex, but in many ways, we're not that complex. And those systems were built to actually make us engage in behaviors that procreate or propagate the species. So when you think about the power of methamphetamine, for example, um, um, the reason why people don't want to eat or sleep or hold a job is because they don't need to. All they need is the meth, and that satisfies all of their desires and their lives completely come apart. Why is that important? Because that has everything to do with how the drug gets into the system as how the, the effect of the drug is. So you can essentially do five things to get a drug into the system. You can snort it, you can swallow it, you can smoke it, you can shoot it, and you can put it in your bottom. So those are the five, you know, kind of five delivery things to make, or shoot it, you know, or shove it, whatever you want to do. That was the fifth S, and people miss that joke because it's not that funny. But those are the five S's of drug delivery. Um, so wait, so let's just think of, you know these things for medical cannabis, right? So um, smoking is combustion. Edibles, you eat these things. Um, you can spray it underneath your tongue. Um, you can stick it on your skin, um, you know, um, and it's transdermal absorption, right? You can stick it in a suppository and put it in your bottom. There's topicals you can rub on and ingestion. Um, oh, and the sixth delivery is skin, obviously. Um, so, and, and then the other one is dabbing. Now, dabbing is a very unfortunate uh, behavior. Dabbing is shown in the lower right panel. They're essentially taking cannabis wax. And if you had a bag of cannabis at home, and I don't suggest you do this, but you could take butane, you could put the cannabis in a colander, and you could take butane and pour butane over the cannabis, and you, whatever distills out the bottom, you can let the butane evaporate, 
And then what you're left with is, is wax that has been extracted from the plant and then the organic solvent volatilizes off and you get wax. And so they take that wax, which is very concentrated in THC, and they put it on what they call a nail. And that nail is that little vertical rod. And then they take a butane torch and they cook it and they inhale it. And it's, a, um, it's an unfortunate because it looks like crack cocaine, which has a whole bunch of different baggage associated with it. So, and then you can vape it. And so vaping is, uh, uh, we'll talk about vaping in a second. But the interesting and important thing to remember is that the government really wants to regulate THC. Okay, of, of all the 104 phytocannabinoids, the government wants to regulate THC. Why? Because it gets you high, which is, you know, I mean, I think if some of us were kind of struggling with, um, you know, that, I think it's, it's right to struggle with that. So, you know, some of the most dangerous drugs we have are the legal ones, like alcohol is dangerous, tobacco is dangerous. Those get us high, but those don't seem to bother anybody. Uh, but THC, uh, for whatever reason, is, is the one that we have to make illegal. So, um, so that's the one that the government regulates. Why am I saying that? Because we've had THC in the form of drugs that we could give to people for a very long time. It was just that under the, under the drug control law signed in 1970 that anything extracted from cannabis sativa was illegal. So you couldn't make a drug with THC by extracting it from cannabis sativa because it was illegal under federal law. But you could manufacture it synthetically. So there are two drugs that are available to be prescribed. One is called dronabinol, it's synthetic THC, and then the other one is nabilone. The problem is no one uses these. I've used them once, uh, but they're thousands of dollars. And so it just doesn't make sense to use them, but they're out there um, and it's important to know that. So uh, we have the opportunity to look at different cannabis products uh, in, in our lab. Um, and we can talk about that in a little bit, but let's talk about the, let's talk about the therapeutic benefit of cannabis and then we'll kind of switch into the harms. And so as we think about, like, if you went to Leafly and you can, you know, if you've got another window open in your browser, you can, while you're listening to my talk, you can go to Leafly. I have no conflicts of interest. You can go there. Um, but if it was up to Leafly, you could pretty much cure any disease by looking at this wheel. And by getting the right combination of cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol and cannabigerol and cannabinol, you can pretty much solve all the world's problems um, by looking at this wheel uh, and figure out what you need to cure. Um, but, you know, that's generally not true. Um, and and what, we, what we really need to think about is what's the evidence, right? So we need to collect evidence and make an informed decision so we can talk intelligently at cocktail parties, maybe most importantly. But, you know, when we're interacting with our patients and they're asking us questions about these things, we can say, we're aware of the data and here's what we believe. And you can speak on authority uh, about these things. So the nice thing is that the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine actually got together, and you can search this if you have another browser, and you can download this tonight and have it on your browser. Uh, this is, this is a, um, a comprehensive report. It's a real, if you're interested in cannabis at all, and you're going on a long plane trip or sitting on the beach um, somewhere on your next vacation, you know, just browse through this document. It's a brilliant document. I mean, if you have interest, in anything about cannabis, this is the document you need to read. I, you know, don't buy anybody's book. You know, don't, don't buy, I don't have a book, but don't buy my book. Uh, but just read this and, and, and so that you can understand really what, the, if you're interested in this field, you need to have this document, read it. It's long, but you can go to the parts you're interested in. But it's a very important document. It's brilliantly, it's brilliantly constructed. And the sort of the cornerstone of this, of this document is this one article that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association um, a, a couple years ago, which was a systematic review. And as you know, a systematic review goes out into the literature and finds all the articles that, you know, looked at randomized trials, okay? And, and then collected those randomized trials and said, does this thing work? for this indication. So if, is there a cannabis article on vomiting? Is there a cannabis article on pain? Do these things work for that? And then it compiles those together. And so here's what you see. You see that there were 28 articles, 79 randomized trials. And when we think about strength of evidence, for all the things that we do in medicine and in dentistry, 
um, and um, all those things that we do, you know, we're doing it because either we just invented it or someone knows that it works. And the way that we know that it works compared to some other intervention is someone did a study. And the best study to do is to randomize patients because you eliminate bias. And so the strongest evidence is really these randomized controlled trials. So there were 28 trials on nausea, 28 on pain, 40, 14 on spasticity, and you can read the rest of the list. And so this was a very interesting and important article. <clears throat> now, when you use that evidence, and I'll, talk, and I'll summarize it, don't worry. I'll, I'll give you some take homes here. You don't have to know all that. So um, when you summarize that, you go, okay, what, what, is it, what works? Of all those studies, what, what really works? Um, <clears throat> and I'll talk about three that probably work from that. But one of the issues that really comes up with a systematic review is that they try to compile all the data in a way that asks the question, is cannabis helpful for this outcome of pain? And you go, yeah, it seems to work. But what they do is they take 28 different studies that have different interventions. Some of them may be smoked cannabis, some of them may be smoked whole plant cannabis, some of them may be pills, some may be dronabinol. And so you don't, and all these are mixed together and says, yeah, cannabis generally works for pain, but what specific cannabinoid product? Is it smoked? Is it shot? Is it put on the skin? Is it placed in your, your, you know, your derriere? These sorts of things. You don't know which one worked because they're all mixed together. So you can say to your patient, I'll tell you which you can say to your patient. When you can say to your patient, I think it works for these things, but what form of delivery actually is most effective? You really can't say. You can maybe trust the outcomes from one or two studies, but you can't actually just put them all together and say, you know, smoked whole plant material works best for this um, based upon the study. So here's the three things you need to remember. So the data is strongest for, and, don't, and, and this is where you go, you, you, some of you in the audience might be saying, oh yeah, but I really know it works for this. That's great. You've got your own anecdote. I got lots of anecdotes too, because I've been working in clinical medicine for 25 years, right? Standing on your head cures hiccups. Um, you know, I, yes, I understand that. But what I'm trying to give you is that here's the things that the evidence works for that suggest that they work for, so that you can say confidently to your patient that if you take this, it's more likely than not to work, okay? Um, so it's nausea, pain, and spasticity. That's it. Those are the ones that are the most compelling evidence for, okay? And that's nice because it's easy to remember, and that's problematic because it's not all the things that everybody wants THC and CBD to be doing, and I get that, but that's not where the evidence is. The evidence is these three things. And um, part of the problem with coming up with the evidence is that the regulatory framework in the government doesn't allow these studies to be done because they're endlessly painful and expensive to go through all those hoops. And no researcher in their right mind really wants to do these studies because of the regulatory framework. So we're really not gonna know, or they're gonna be done offshore, or this is what we're stuck with, okay? But I, the, I wanted to tell you that you know in 1970, when they made the Drug Control Act signed into law, um, they actually had a program at the federal level that made marijuana joints for patients. And they would, would actually, they continued to do this even, through after, even after it was illegal because they thought it worked for glaucoma. So, the, so patients with glaucoma got canisters filled with marijuana cigarettes sent to their home that they could smoke gratis the federal government, which is just crazy to think about. But anyway, they would get these things, and the data suggests it's not, it's not effective for that. So once again, this was someone's bright idea, pet project, or something way, way back when, and said, we're going to make this program and make special cigarettes that are illegal for everybody else to have, but this program and the government's going to have it because it works for glaucoma. It doesn't work for glaucoma. In fact, it probably makes eye pressures worse. So once again, what happens is when public policy gets in front of uh, actual science, we just we make stupid decisions about these things, and we need to be more informed. So the other thing that's great about this document uh, with the National Academy of Sciences is that they kind of broke the uh, evidence into different tiers. And you do that with any of these, you know, because you're, you've got 28 studies or you got two, 
And you can't say that they're both conclusive. You say the 28 studies are probably conclusive, but the two are suggestive. So they broke it down to conclusive, substantial, uh, adequate, or inadequate, and they kind of go through these things. So I'm just going to give you that, the, once again, the three things that are the evidence that the National Academies of Sciences said was that there is conclusive and substantial evidence that it works for chronic pain, probably smoked plant material, but there were others, reduced chemotherapy, or, or, sorry, reducing chemotherapy nausea. Those are the oral ones, the pills that I talked about that are like $1,000 a piece. And then multiple sclerosis, spasticity, which are the pills that were like $1,000 a piece. So those are the things. So, uh, so that was easy. Now the hard part. So what are the adverse effects? So what's important to remember is that we don't have a lot of knowledge uh, about cannabis. And we can talk about how cannabis has more tar than a cigarette. And, you know, if, and, and, you know should we, um, you know, cannabis is way better than alcohol in these sorts of things. And we can have those discussions during the last 30 minutes. And I have very strong opinions about them um, that you can, you know, take as your own and share at wherever you have these discussions. But, but I think the important thing to remember is that because we don't have really good data, and there's two reasons we don't have good data. One of this, the regulatory framework, the government has not allowed us to study THC uh, in a meaningfully um, useful way. And number two, people tend to underreport drug use, especially when it's illegal. So you don't have good epi, and you don't have good clinical trials. And, um, and then the, the third thing is because medical cannabis programs are relatively new. Most of the data about adverse effects, and I'm going to say this twice, most of the data of adverse effects are in high-risk populations smoking marijuana joints. I'll say this again. Most of the data about the adverse effects of cannabis are among high-risk populations, that is populations that also use alcohol and shoot heroin and have high-risk sexual activity and use tobacco. Most of the data is in those high-risk populations and those patients mostly smoke marijuana from drug dealers. Okay, so it's like, how are you supposed to use this data to tell your 86-year-old that you just certified that she's not going to become schizophrenic because the data suggests that it, she might. And that's because the data is in not her population. It's not the drug she's using. And the data is not in any way meaningful for these populations. So uh, let me just, I, I'll expand on this. It's not, I'm not dismissing it. I think this, because you need to know this stuff because people will ask. And so then I'm gonna share this with you. So there is an association between cannabis use and the incidence of psychotic or psychotic or schizotypal symptoms, which is very alarming because schizophrenia can be forever um, and schizophrenia can be very debilitating. What's difficult from an epidemiologic perspective is that cannabis also treats some of the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. When you have schizophrenia, you have auditory hallucinations. And when you smoke marijuana, the auditory hallucinations seem to go away a bit. So is it that people who are self-treating their psychotic symptoms smoke marijuana, and then when assessed, go on to seem like they have psychosis, except they had it before? Or does marijuana or cannabis really increase the risk of psychotic type symptoms? And the answer is, in this world where there is no black and white, and fiction is truth and truth is fiction, both things are probably happening. That, that, that it is true that patients are probably self-selecting for self-treatment, but they're also getting symptoms that they didn't have because of it. And when you look at the brains of rats, adolescent rats, and I realize kids are not rats, and most of this data is from kids, is that you um, see that when you, when you have a lot of cannabis exposure and you euthanize those rats and look at their brains, the wiring of those brains looks a lot like the brains of schizophrenics. So you, if you have kids under the age of 25 who are using cannabis regularly, you need to be afraid of cannabis, for sure, no question. And the reason is, is because the brain continues to develop till the age of 25, and any time you put a potentially addictive substance that rewires the neurophysiology like cannabis seems to, you are setting that person up potentially for lifelong alteration. I'm not saying they're gonna be a disaster, 
I'm not saying they're going to have lots of trouble, but heavier use is associated with more of those adverse consequences. But I make the distinction up until the age of 25. So as an addiction researcher who certifies patients for medical cannabis, two things. Number one, you need to know that the brain continues to develop till the age of 25. And 99% of all addiction is established before the age of 25. Talk to your patients. When did they start smoking? When did they start drinking? It's never going to be after 25. And if it is after 25, ask them what addiction they had right before that. Okay? 99%, 99.9% of all addiction is established before the age of 25. And if you have a person who is never exposed to a potentially addictive substance and they use it after the age of 25, the likely, that likelihood that they will become addicted is 0%. Okay? 0%. That brain development up until the age of 25 is critical for neurologic development. So uh, the way I sleep at night is if you made me king of the world tomorrow, uh, you don't have to because we already have another king apparently, but you, if you made me king of the world tomorrow, um, if you made me king of the world tomorrow, I would say the, the way to solve the addiction crisis that we have in America, we have an addiction crisis in America that is so massive and so uncontrolled, it exceeds anything humanity has ever seen before and any other country in the world has ever seen or will ever see. There's something wrong with America and it's addiction. And, and when, you, when, you, when, you, when you look at that uh, and, you, and you ask that, you know, what are, what are we doing? How are we thinking about this? How, how, how do we go down this avenue and how do we solve it? The way you solve the addiction crisis is you make any potentially addictive substance inaccessible till the age of 25. And within 30 years, you will get rid of your addiction problem. But that's never going to happen. That's not reality and that's not the world we live in. So that's my spiel on uh, kind of how, as an addiction expert, I never certify anybody the age of 25. Under the age of 25, never going to happen. Never going to, I ask, see the request and I go, nope, that's not a thing. But I certify a lot of 65-year-olds who come back and say, you've changed my life. Okay. And I share this information about psychosis and I share this information. I say, the cannabis you're using is very different than the cannabis that is informed by this. Cannabis is very strongly associated with depression. Um, and once again, this is in adolescents who use cannabis. Um, cannabis is associated with memory problems. So in schizophrenics, it seems to improve memory. But in people who, don't, who aren't schizophrenic, it makes memory worse. There's also good evidence that cannabis is associated with um, uh, respiratory disease. There's much more tar in cannabis than there is in cigarettes and people, uh, but there just isn't a lot more data um, to help us because people underreport it. And there's also a dosing difference, right? If you smoke 20 cigarettes a day uh, of cigarettes, conventional cigarettes, and you smoke 20 cigarettes of marijuana, you're in a coma. Like there's a just totally different dosing here. So you can't even really make them parallel. But there's a lot more tar in cannabis than cigarettes. Substantial evidence of a risk between uh, uh, cannabis and increased risk of motor vehicle collisions. Moderate evidence of statistical association between that and overdose injuries. But cannabis doesn't result in overdose. It's almost impossible to overdose from cannabis. You you're pass out before you can administer enough and these sorts of things. Um, so the reason why they say this is because cannabis use in these studies is associated with other high risk behaviors such as opioid use, and meth use um, and alcohol use. And there's substantial evidence uh, between uh, cannabis use and lower birth weight of the offspring. So here's a summary. You need to be aware, despite all the caveats I gave you that I'm not gonna repeat now, you need to be aware that cannabis potentially increases the risk for psychotic symptoms, depression, memory problems, respiratory symptoms, accidents, and low birth weight. So let's talk a little bit about the legal considerations of medical cannabis. So what's interesting and important to remember is the reason why that adverse event data does not inform us about medical cannabis um, uh, is because the cannabis that I'm giving to my patients or that, the, and I'll talk about, I don't give cannabis to my patients because I'd lose my license and I'll talk about how this is structured. But the cannabis that my patients are taking is, is, is very different. It's extracted, it's purified, and, that's, and, and it's low THC and high CBD, not always, 
but 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 you but the products are purified and combined in different in different ways. Um, and what's important to remember is that after they started developing horticultural programs and medical cannabis programs that had low THC and high CBD, you can see that over here on the right, a lot of other states started to sign on. And here's where we are in terms of cannabis. This is a great website. It's called Procon.org. You can go there and kind of, it's cool because you can drill down on each state and you can actually read the law and, you know, read the legislature's um, impression of the law and these sort of things. And, governor signing and all these things. And you can look at, here are the 33 legal medical marijuana states and the 11 legal recreational marijuana states. And you can go through that. Why is that important? Because it has important implications that if Trump decided tomorrow to go after states for medical cannabis, our patients really have nothing to be afraid of because Trump wouldn't be going after them. It'd be going after the states. And the states, 50 of them or 33 or are going to sue Trump in federal court, and all of us and our grandchildren will be dead by the time that ever gets decided. So nothing's going to happen in this space. My patients are afraid. I'm like, nothing's going to happen. They're not worried about you. They're worried about what the states are doing with these things, and, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but here's, here's what's going on. So, so THC, the, the one that gets you high, is the one the feds care about. That's it. So they're regulating THC, and THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, remains illegal under federal law. There was a group of providers in Oregon that tried to prescribe it, and they got a letter from the DEA that said, you can prescribe it from jail. And they said, okay, I will stop. So you can't prescribe THC um, uh, under federal law. But CBD, two things have happened with CBD. Number one, there was a drug that was approved by the FDA for childhood seizures called a Pedialex. And they made it a scheduled five for the first time um, since it became illegal. Um, CBD became a schedule five and CBD under Trump's Farm Bill Act is legal if it's only if it's extracted from hemp. And hemp by definition is 0.3% THC. And it is in the hemp is produced in a manner consistent with the Farm Bill and all the associated state regulations and by a licensed grower, okay? The licensed grower is the sticky widget for a lot of states. What does licensing mean, right? So that's, that's the sticky widget. But uh, so you see these proliferation of CBD shops and they will all tell you that it's derived from hemp, okay? So this is a typical, this is a typical store. Uh, this is whole plant material um, and you've got different, um, you can see the percentages of THC. They vary by THC. That's why I have that. Um, so let's just talk about the Minnesota cannabis. So I understand you guys from other states and things and in Canada. And, and so things are, the architecture is a little different, but I just want to describe Minnesota, not because you need to know, but because it just describes a typical cannabis medical program and how it works so that I'm not actually having this telecon from jail. How, how is it that I'm not in jail? I've certified 83 patients. I'm not in jail. I'm doing fine. All right, so why is that? How does that work? Okay, so in Minnesota, the way they structured the law is so that people like me could certify patients. All I do as a physician or as a provider is say, yes, Mrs. Jones has one of these qualifying conditions. That's it. The state says, that's all you gotta do, Ebert. Just do that, we'll take care of the rest. And what the state of Minnesota took care of was they, they contracted with two uh, cannabis growers that they have exclusive contracts with who make this stuff, who have eight dispensaries around the state of Minnesota that patients then go to and work with the pharmacist and get their vapes and get their um, sublingual droppers and, and they get their topicals and, and, and they get the things that they need to feel better. But, but they can't ask me, I can't tell them what to do. I don't, I'm basically not involved after I certify them. That's all they need. And I actually go on to an ele electronic portal. I put their name in, I put their age in, I put their email in because it's all electronic. I certify them for the condition. They get an email as they're sitting right in my office. They pay 200 bucks and they're in. That's it. That's how you do it. It's amazing. All right. So these are the qualifying conditions. And since July 16, pain came online. Uh, autism, sleep apnea, no evidence. But once again, this is special interest group getting way ahead of science and sleep apnea data might be rat data and they could still get it approved, it's, which is another issue that I'm just not happy with. But 
Anyway, so these are the things you can do in Minnesota. Pill liquid oil, um, and the oil is either ingested or a vaporizer. They've got Minnesota Medical Solutions in these areas in LeafLine Labs. And uh, what I just wanted to mention is that the, the way that they construct this is that for, for my local dispensary, uh, once the patient goes into the dispensary, this is a dual phytocannabinoid program. So these are not whole plant extracts. These are not whole plant material. The state of Minnesota made a decision, you can't smoke this stuff, people, and you can't smoke the whole plant because like we learned in cigarettes, that's gonna kill you, right? So they said, but you can vaporize it if it's purified. And, and then what they do is they purify the THC, they purify the CBD, and then they put them together and they come up with these different blends. So they have THC dominant blends, they have CBD dominant blends, and then you can have these different things in between. And patients come back and they say, um, oh, I'm using MidMed Red, um, I'm taking the pills or I'm, or I'm taking these vaporizers and it seems to be working really well. Uh, just to kind of, you know, there's almost 1700 healthcare practitioners uh, that are signed up for this. Um, and uh, more, more patients are coming online. You can see after uh, July 2016, there was a really kind of an inflection point there. Well, not really inflection, but a rapid uptake uh, there uh, where after July 16, when pain came online, you really see it, you saw it start to take off. Um, so I've had lots of experience with this. And I have lots of, I've had some patients come back and say the pills were too expensive. I could not afford them. And so price is an issue. So I think price is the biggest barrier that our patients face. Um, and, that's, and that's difficult um, because, you know, I've been doing clinical medicine for 25 years and I've seen a lot of things in my day. Um, but up until I started certifying, I've never had a lot of pile of patients come back and say, I've, I've changed their lives, uh, which is pretty powerful. I, I had a woman come in the other day uh, and her husband was with her and she said, you basically gave her a reason to live because she was crippled in this wheelchair, chronic pain. She's taking her pills and she takes her MinMed Red and puts the topicals on. Her husband's regulating her pills and, and she actually said she's pain free for like the first time in 30 years. So you see some miraculous transformations, but not everybody's happy as you can see here and price is an issue. Um, and then they'll say things like, well, there's better cannabis in Colorado. And here's the thing, these are state programs and THC is illegal under federal law. And when you go into our dispensaries in Minnesota, they get a little bottle with their name on it that says Minnesota uh, cannabis program. And it's got like a prescription, like from a pharmacy you know, or a little prescription on the bottle. It's got their name and it's got the dosing. It's got everything. So if they got pulled over, the cops could say, what is that stuff? If the dog goes crazy and they said, oh, here's my bottle, right? So it's, it's marked, it's well done. The website teaches law enforcement how to manage the situation. But because THC is under federal law, it's illegal to transport it across straight lines, state lines and you will go to jail. Also, you will go to jail potentially if you bring it on a plane because TSA is a federal agency. Now, I've had patients say they got away with it and I said, lucky you. I hope your luck holds out because if you get that stuff confiscated, number one, it's expensive. And number two, that's gonna be a long day for you. So don't bring it on a plane. It's, these are state laws within state boundaries. Your state is great. You love your state. Thank God for your state because we're helping you get your stuff, but don't take it out of the state. And that's kind of what they need to know. Um, the other, so another patient that's been more positive um, was that they had pain relief. Um, they figured out what their dosing was. When they go to the pharmacy or when they go to the dispensary, uh, they have pay, the, the pharmacist works with them and tries to figure out what their pain is and, or what their spasticity is and works with them and makes adjustments over time. They pay $200 for the entire year and then they pay as you go one month at a time. Uh, it's a cash business. Um, the other struggle is that you can't FDIC, federal uh, insurance, you can't federally insure banks that are ex accepting drug money. So a lot of these dispensaries are still cash business. I think they've worked some of that out, honestly. I haven't been following that closely, but maybe some of you know, uh, but maybe you can deposit in banks. But it used to be a big cash business because you couldn't get FDIC insurance and deposit uh, money from the sale of cannabis. 
So, um, so they pay as you go. You don't have to, you're not able, obligated to buy every month. Um, so those, those are kind of the experiences. So, so what am I doing? I just, so what am I doing? So I'm a, I'm a tobacco researcher. I've been doing tobacco work for 20 years. Um, and I'm also a primary care provider who's passionate about going into clinical practice and seeing the problems that my patients have and then walking out and walking into a lab and trying to solve these problems. So it was back in the day at the turn of the century when I started my clinical practice um, as a consultant at Mayo Clinic, I saw everybody dying from tobacco related illnesses. And so I said, well, let's stop that. Let's do interventions. And so I did that for a while. Now everybody seems to be living with chronic pain. So I'm like, okay, well, this is important. I mean, I mean, everybody's coming. What about CBD? Can I vaporize it? So what we did, I'm very interested in drug delivery through vaporization. And so we developed an inhaled particle aerosol lab here at the Mayo Clinic, and we essentially vaporize cannabis. And in the state of Minnesota, as of January 1st, 2020, uh, we have gone around to local CBD shops and bought CBD and we're vaporizing it using standard vaporization technologies developed by the tobacco industry on the left and putting the vaporization in there. And then we're actually going into the uh, nuclear magnetic resonance imaging spectroscopy and we're actually learning what's in the vapor. And just to show you, I mean, this is, this is where the science is because my patient, hey, is the vape safe? Because there's this big E-Valley thing. What's going on with E-Valley? And I can talk about that in the question session um, because the E-Valley is what all these people uh, are getting sick from. And so we take the vaporization, you see that pen there, and, that, and, and you see that little liquid, that golden liquid there is the, is, the, is the cannabis oil. And then we vaporize that through the machine, and then uh, we capture it in these uh, glass tubes that are submerged in um, acetone and dry ice. And these are the curves we see. So we can actually look at the aerosol that we capture and then look and see what's in there. Why is that important? Because labeling is only like 30% accurate um, is what people have found. And so why is that important? Because two things. Number one, if it's under-labeled, it's not gonna work. If it's over-labeled, you might get sick. And number three, um, actually some of these products that are not supposed to contain THC actually do. So if kids find that out, they're gonna be going to the CBD shops because hey man, there's THC in there. So. So this is important to understand from a public health perspective, but it's also, you know, it, it's also uh, important to know from an efficacy uh, perspective. Why doesn't it work? And it's because the efficacy is different. The other thing that's important to remember is that, remember I told you that uh, tetrahydrocannab or that the cannabinoids are very um, uh, receptive to UV light. So that means they're receptive to energy. And what do they do when they receive UV light to protect the plant? They transform into other cannabinoids. And so what we see when you vaporize these devices at 350 degrees on those heated coils, you actually make new cannabinoids. So we're seeing the cannabinoids that were supposed to be there. We're seeing cannabinoids that weren't supposed to be there. And we're also seeing new cannabinoids that get created. Like no one has any idea what's going on. I mean, it's complete chaos. And we're trying to get to the bottom of the chaos. So we're very excited about the work we're doing in that space. All right, we're at the top of the hour. So a little, there was a brief uh, history of cannabis in the United States. I want you to uh, understand what uh, medical cannabis is. Uh, I wanted you to recount the evidence for therapeutic risks and benefits, um, and then kind of know the legal architecture and because patients are going to ask. Um, and then I want you to understand a little bit about the Minnesota Medical Cannabis Program, uh, because that's the one we're most familiar with, um, and that um, uh, has been a sample or example uh, for lots of states. Uh, around the country who are coming online uh, with cannabis programs. Okay, uh, and with that, um, okay, uh, do people have any questions? So uh, please ask the questions here. Yep, I agree, I've got that, I've got that up. Okay, so how is medical marijuana used by uh, health professionals viewed? So we did a survey, uh, let me start out by saying, um, it's, it's, I think what has happened is, is a lot of my, so I can just speak to my colleagues because I've interviewed them and I've done a survey. Uh, my, my, my colleagues are dubious. My colleagues are dubious because of this idea that there is a lot more social energy than there is scientific energy in the space. Um, and so they are worried 
that when they see things like glaucoma come out uh, for state programs and there's zero evidence for glaucoma, that it's completely misguided and misinformed. And so when they hear it only works for three things, they tend to be a little bit more open to it. And they said, oh, that's something I can work with. So I'll only certify patients for these three things. Um, and then, and then um, patients can uh, figure out the rest on their own. Because patients can actually go, and I've heard my colleagues recommend patients, just go to the CBD shop and try it. Um, so that's kind of that's how uh, my colleagues have viewed. When I, when I did my survey on my, my colleagues, it was very clear that none of them knew anything about it. Um, still lots of misinformation, lots of disinformation, lots of lack of information, um, those, those sorts of things. Um, so I think that that is uh, one of the things that we're struggling with. Okay, so why do so many providers have ethical issues? It's a great question. So what happens with law in complicated societies like America is law becomes morality. And when you make something illegal, we've got thought leaders and religious leaders, and we've got special interest groups that then take the, you must follow the law or it's a sin, becomes a moral issue. That's a way oversimplification of the complexity of this. But you will find that many of the things that we consider to be illegal are also considered to be immoral, but the morality question has not been asked, right? So, so I will tell you um, um, that my, my colleagues, some of my colleagues don't certify because they don't think it's moral. And I don't quite understand that. What I understand is this. I understand that my patients seem to improve with this substance. I understand that um, I don't certify, I have some bright lines. I understand that I am not a proponent of recreational marijuana, um, that I have in my, in, my, in, the, in my thinking, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, that's where I've landed. Um, and, but I don't, to your point, I don't know why um, there's so much morality other than the fact that it became, um, that when, when, when legislation um, is in the corpus of the community knowledge, it becomes a morality issue. And, it's just a phenomenon I don't quite understand. So, uh, so do, I, do I see a potential use for cannabis and gentle dental work? So, so this is a great question. So I will tell you that some of the most effective therapies, and I've actually certified patients for medical cannabis, is topical therapies. And I will tell you that topical therapies that have a little bit of THC in them seem to work a little bit better than the ones that are exclusively CBD. So the question is, um, you know, and if we think about the indications, we think about pain, spasticity, nausea, and vomiting. Other than pain, I'm not really sure, at least for systemic use of it, you know, what might be important for general dental work. The question is, could it be something that we could use for focal or local pain because it's safe to be ingested? Um, so because it's safe to be ingested, um, uh, generally, you know, the question is, could there be, as we think about the general care of dentistry, to avoid opioids, we could say, great, we're just gonna give you this topical CBD oil. I'm sure patients would be pumped about that. You know, you say CBD, everybody's really excited. They almost forget about the word oxycodone when you say CBD. So it might be an opportunity there. Um, okay. Um, so there are many places that claim that CBD oil can help medically. So here, so you've got some evidence already existing that CBD works. How do you know that? Because you have an FDA approved medication that is basically CBD extracted from cannabis that treats two very severe, severe forms of childhood seizures. And when you talk to the parents that have had Dravet syndrome or Lenogast out, which are the two syndromes, that instead of their kid drooling all day is actually doing math in school now, you ask those parents if you think CBD works, because it does. The question is dose. The question is dose. The question is indication. Um, you know, th those are the things that we really don't know a lot about. Because if you, if you don't have Dravet syndrome and you don't have Lenogastel, you can't get the drug. You know, so, but everybody's got everything else. So the question is dose. The question is concentration. Um, so those are the things we really need to kind of um, work out. 
so how does medical marijuana affect our patient anesthesia and recommendations for pre-op? Um, so when we think about uh, when we think about anesthesia, um, and we think about um, uh, can CBD less likely, THC more likely. Um, CBD, you know, here's the thing about CBD. CBD doesn't really even act on the CB1 receptors. If it does, it does really kind of remotely or um, kind of, you know, um, uh, partially not a complete agonist at CB1, um, you know, where THC. So I would say that the most important consideration, we think about medical cannabis, if you're going to be doing pre or anesthesia, and you're like, do you take medical cannabis? Yes. Is there THC in it? Yes. Okay, we need to think about that. So what is the dosing? Um, are you having a lot of psychoactive, you know, because it, it, could, it, it could impact recovery. Um, we do know that there is data out there that suggests that cannabis is, 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 is behaviorally dependence forming. And we know that because patients go through some withdrawal symptoms when they stop uh, cannabis. But that's most likely THC. Um, and so if we think about the molecules that are acting, it would probably be the most important one pre-op and perioperatively would be THC. Okay, so I have, I have a patient with chronic back pain. Using CBD can be found in drug testing. Great question. So here's the thing. So THC is what they detect in drug testing. They don't detect CBD, okay? So if you, if you have a patient who's really truly can, taking a CBD exclusive um, uh, product that's pure, no THC, they will test negative on a drug test. Absolutely. If they test positive, that's because the product wasn't that great and there's a little bit of THC in there. Um, so that's important to remember. Uh, PTSD. So there's more data coming out about medical cannabis. There is a section in the new, uh, the National Academy of Sciences on PTSD. Um, I've had anecdotal evidence that, that my patients use it for PTSD. I think my patients want to use it for anxiety. What I worry about with uh, cannabis and anxiety is in the short term, it makes it better. In the long term, it makes it heinous. It can exacerbate anxiety long term. And so um, so I think that if we think about someone who has PTSD, the last thing you want to be doing is administering something that could potentially make their anxiety worse. Now, I know I have patients who have been to war in Iraq and um, Afghanistan who come back and say, the only thing that helps me through the day is marijuana. Like, I get it. Um, but I wouldn't be uncomfortable prescribing it um, for that until we get a little bit more evidence. But there are some states that are online for PTSD. Minnesota is not a PTSD state. We need to think about psycho this, you know, the psychological indications a lot more, I think. Um, oh yeah, qualifying medical conditions, thank you. So let me go back to the qualifying medical indications. Someone asked about that. Let's go back here, okay. Other than pain, autism, and sleep apnea, uh, these are the ones that we have for our qualifying. So, uh, glaucoma is there. Annoying. I don't know why it's there. Um, so those are the ones that we see. Um, are there high risk groups who can develop addiction at age? Of, yeah. So what I so there are high risk groups that can. So when you talk to my when my when I talk to my patients who have addiction who said I started smoking at 34, and I go, oh, that's interesting because that you know, I'm, and they said oh, before that I was drinking alcohol. Well, how, I, but I started that when I was 26. Oh, that's interesting. Like, what was going? Oh, oh, but I've had anorexia since I was fourteen. You know, so yeah, there's high. You know, there's this sort of constellation of of you know of, of coping mechanisms that people seem. So I, I I come across very strong about the twenty five thing. But you know, it, it's really illustrative of what I've seen in my career and what I seem to think um, the evidence seems to suggest. So you do see addiction over twenty five. The question is. What was happening before that? And what was the risk factor that at 34, you somehow decided to take up cigarette smoking? Like, in what world is that? I mean, and what, you know, actually, you know, it's it, it, the interesting story about this is Hertz Rent-A-Car knew this in the 1970s. What did Hertz do? 
Hertz said you couldn't rent a car until the age of 25. Why was that? Because they looked at actuarial data. And what happened at the age of 25 with actuarial data is there was a precipitous decline in accidents. And it just so happened, 40 years later, functional MRI imaging shows that the brain continues to develop to the age of 25. Up until the end of brain development, risk-taking behavior is actually part of the development process of the human brain. You are experiencing the world. You are trying things. You are playing with you are coping, you are interacting, you're taking things in, you're putting things out. That, and then that 25, that changes. Um, and that's actually when brain development ends. So I don't think we understand enough about it, but that's kind of where uh, we're at uh, with this. Um, how effective is topical? So I think topical CBD THC is very effective for arthritic pain in some patients. The, pe the, 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 the limitation is, um, limitation with that is is really expense um, if they have to apply it on a big area that's a problem um, I've also found that I, the other anecdote about that is for patients that take THC and CBD for pain because I, I mentioned to you that CBD is effective for neuropathic pain and I mentioned that CBD is effective for the treatment of seizures which essentially reduces nerve transmission so if you think about neuropathic pain where you've got your nerve firing and causing excruciating pain all the time, or you've got a seizure going on where all the neurons are going off, you put some CBD on there, you, you lower the seizures, you decrease the nerve transmission, you lower the pain, you decrease the nerve transmission. When you think about that, that's pain. The thing that we've sort of missed in the whole opioid epidemic is we never differentiated the most important thing to differentiate the difference between pain and suffering. And, and because we never did that, none of the, what we're doing to try to fix it makes sense. You know, you can have a, the same amount of pain as measured, by a, um, as, as measured by a galvanetric measurement on fingers between two people with knee pain. They've got the same galvanometric changes in their skin. So that's like some sort of physiologic manifestation of pain. And one could be, walking around with no problem, and the other could be writhing in pain on the floor. That's suffering. We can't quantitate suffering. Pain's different. So when I, 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 the reason I say that is because when we look at, CB, when we look at CBD, uh, CBD may be helping with pain, and THC actually might be helping with suffering because it does have a little bit of a psychoactive effect. And my patients tell me this. What do they say? They say, you know, when my pain's you know, moderate, I'm taking CBD. When my pain's severe, I take a little bit of THC and it seems to really help. So it's an interesting paradigm. I kind of just made it up on my own. No one's ever said that, um, but you know, test it out, drive it around, kick the tires on that. See if that makes sense to you and let me know, send me an email. Um, so I don't, so, so when we talk about addiction, you know, cannabis has withdrawal, but, uh, and it has a, I certainly, um, I certainly know that there are patients who can't seem to live without cannabis. We need to be very clear in how we define addiction. Because I always have these debates with people. Well, I run every day, Ebert, and, and I just can't stop. Does that mean I'm addicted? You know, that's what they say to me. Like, are you kidding me? Okay, so here's the thing. Addiction is not just something that you feel like you have to do all the time. Addiction is three things. It's dependence. That is, you need a higher and higher dose to get the same effect. It's, 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 it's withdrawal. You stop it, you go into withdrawal. And it's also that the, your life falls apart. Um, that's the third thing that people forget, is that running every day doesn't make your life fall apart. In fact, it maybe makes you more functional. So therefore, I don't accept it as an addiction. Stop talking to me. This is not what we're talking about. But people on meth, people on cannabis who don't go to school anymore because they're home smoking weed all the time, that's an addiction. Why? Because they're not going to school anymore. They're home smoking weed. I mean, what, I mean, what more do you need to know? I mean, so so... It's all about how it manifests. And we can't narrowly define addiction. And a lot of the mistakes we're making in clinical medicine and a lot of the mistakes we're making in this field of cannabis is we're going forward and we're saying addiction, 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 when people aren't thinking about what addiction is. So we have to broadly define it. Um, so, so, so that's the thing. So where, what are the bright lines? So my bright lines are 25 and older are the only people I certify. That's it. Um, 
and and I would say that my bright lines um, are that I, I oh, oh someone raised their, so wait I got notes and someone raised their hand so does the hand actually make it more important is there a crisis is something happening okay so um, so when I think about uh, that bright line that that's that's my bright line is that I actually and I also do a lot of e-cigarette work and the debate in e-cigarette is kind of like the debate we're having in cannabis and I don't want to go too far afield in e-cigarettes but I want to just have this one common understanding of how I look at it. The problem in the e-cigarette, which I think you can parallel to cannabis, is that people are yelling past each other. They're not actually listening to the fact that when we talk about electronic cigarettes or electronic drug delivery, generally, that there are the people like the tobacco smokers who are dying. So every, you know, we talk about the e-valley crisis, and I think there's a, maybe a question on the e-valley, what happened there? I saw, and it, it, someone interviewed me the other day and said, oh, Ebert, you know, like 60 patients have died from E-Valley. What do you think? And I said, do you realize that that's as many people as die in one hour since 1950 with tobacco? Yep, E-Valley is important, but people are dying from tobacco that many every hour since 1950. There's bigger problems, right? And I'm not saying E-Valley is not important because it is. Please spend your time, study it, figure it out. But I got people dying back here. And they want to use these cigarettes to quit, right? So the other thing is adolescents who were never exposed to drugs before, okay? And they might actually start smoking a cigarette that's going to kill them 30 years down the road, and they otherwise would not have unless they have an e-cigarette. I'm a non-starter. Kids should not be using e-cigarettes, period. It's changing their brains. It's setting them up for addiction. It's setting them up for mood problems. It's setting them up for long-term health problems. End of story. My bright line is 25. That's it. And so, so, so that's a bright line. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, what? Okay. So, since medical cannabis is new, what are we seeing for long-term effects? So it's important to remember that when we look at addiction, and I've learned a lot of things from tobacco um, in the 25 years I've been studying it. We started smoking in this country in, in, in the early 1900s, and then Buck Duke developed the mass cigarette manufacturing device, and we sent it to all of our, with all of our soldiers to fight World War I. They all came back hooked, and then we sent them to fight World War II. They all came back hooked. We sell it you know, um, all over the streets. Um, and, and what we learned was that it took 50 years for us to actually publish a paper in 1950 in JAMA that said smoking is associated with lung disease and might cause cancer. 50 years, okay? So what you've got is you've got a problem of, we need the information now, but we're not gonna understand the true impact until many years down the road. So there's that, there's that issue. So we know that there are acute effects. So, so let's talk about the acute effects. So E-Valley is e-cigarette and vaping associated lung injury. I have contacts with the Minnesota Department of Health who told me that the crisis is declining. Um, and that they're actually going from active um, engagement to passive surveillance because what's happening is, is, is they're just seeing the cases go down. And I think that's a lot because of the information went out there. But here's what happened with E-Valley. What we're having is we're having this fascinating confluence of e-cigarettes with electronic devices delivering nicotine also being used to deliver cannabis, okay? So it's an interesting confluence of events. And so what we're, what we're seeing is uh, we're, we're actually seeing um, that people were using these devices to deliver cannabis. And when you look at the E-Valley cases that caused this lung disease, 80% uh, of them contains THC. 80% of them are from pre-filled pods uh, that they stuck in a jewel type device. And 80% were from informal sources. That is a drug dealer, uh, a friend, uh, or off the street. Um, you know, or on the internet. So, you know, so that helped us understand that. And then everybody just stopped vaping or, you know, vaping cannabis. Not everybody, but, you know, that's what we see. So, so the short-term risks are real. The long-term risks, I think we have to work out with, uh, with, with cannabis. Um, can medical marijuana uh, be used for acute pain? So, so when we think about acute, so what, usually what I see, it, so for acute pain, I, there's not a lot of data. What I see is I see acute on chronic. So I see a lot of chronic pain. I got a lot of pain in my practice. I mean, most of the time, I mean, when I, I went into a, a primary care internal medicine, 
but I learned addiction medicine because for most of my life, primary care medicine has been addiction medicine. So, I mean, it's just a mess, right? So, so usually what I deal with is I deal with chronic pain and I deal with acute exacerbations of chronic pain. Um, and so when I think about acute pain, I think about the four delivery mechanisms that patients have at their disposal. And one of the delivery mechanisms is vaping. So the advantage of vaping cannabis is you get second to second titration of the dose. Uh, your sublingual is the next fastest, uh, topical is the third fastest, and pills are probably the fourth fastest, if you will, or slowest. And, and why is that important? Patients can self-manage acute on chronic pain by doing moment to moment titration of a vaporized cannabis um, device and fluid. Um, and so I, I think that's important to remember. Um, uh, the other thing is that um, when you swallow THC, it actually, the reason why, you know, they have this funny, it's not funny, but they have this meme um, where it's like, uh, ate, ate, a, ate, a, ate a cannabis brownie, no effect. 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 Ate a cannabis brownie, needed the emergency room, right? So the problem with oral is that what happens is that the THC gets hydroxylated and it has a slow onset of action. So they don't know when they're taking their pills or they're eating their gummies because everybody's eating you know, cannabis gummies now. They don't know. They, they, so they eat 50 gummies and the next thing there is like in a coma, right? This is a bad idea. So, you know, so there are better mechanisms that allow moment to moment titration, but a cannabis gummy is not going to deal with acute pain, but vaping, vaping might. Okay. Uh, no, no known efficacy for sleep apnea. There were some rat studies. You can look those up. But if you went on, in all seriousness, if you went to the Minnesota website, um, when you look at these different diseases, they, you can look at submissions from people who have a special interest, and, they, and you can look at their evidence. And so we looked at the evidence, and it was like, it was like rat data um, you know, for sleep apnea. So I, don't, you know, I, I haven't certified patients. Um, for, and there was like one human study, um, I think. Um, and, and so we can look that up, but, but I, so let's see what else. Okay. So how do you reconcile not certifying people under 25 when one of the most effective uh, uses of childhood seizures? So important clarification. When I certify a patient for medical cannabis, they go to the dispensary and they work with those pharmacists. If I, if I was a childhood seizure doctor, I would prescribe CBD. It's totally different. When they go to the cannabis, they're on their own. They're self-managing their pain. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're working with the pharmacist. Um, I'm okay with them being on a little bit of THC. Um, if I had a kid with childhood seizure, I'd be prescribing the CBD. I'd see them every week. I would manage the meds. I would titrate the meds. It's, it's kind of over here and, and, and really over here, two different things. Um, how, um, okay. Have you seen a rise in medical marijuana use by medical providers and how medical dental societies view their use while still practicing? So is this a question? Um, okay. Have you seen a rise in medical marijuana use that is like me smoking marijuana or, or somebody's like a, like a, you know, so, so have we seen cannabis consumption in, increasing among uh, professionals? And the answer is, I don't really know uh, for, for, for personal use, um, but in medical societies and dental societies, THC is clearly, anything with THC clearly impairs you. And we have had people who have um, been removed from their jobs for consuming it. And, and so the problem is you can't make important medical or dental decisions high on THC. And so you put patient safety at risk. And so I think that would probably be a standard. Now, if you have a cannabis problem, there are professional societies um, that will, um, dental and medical that will actually, the boards will follow you and test your urine and make sure that you stop doing that. Um, do, are there providers out there uh, that use CBD, uh, rub it on their toe at night because they've got pain? Um, there might be, um, but, but, but I don't know. Um, yeah, so are there conditions that, current, that, are, that aren't currently approved by the state that you believe would be helpful? So all the ones that I'm interested in, um, you know, so we see muscle spasms on there. Um, we, see, we see vomiting. Um, we see pain. 
Um, are there other ones? Not right now. I think the list is long um, um, and, and maybe longer than maybe is justified by the current state of affairs. Um, so does THC, CBD affect wound healing? Okay. So when you, let's talk about that for a second. That's a good one. Okay. So one of the questions I had, and I gave medical grand rounds today on e-cigarettes, actually, one of the questions came up was, you know, why, why is it that the cigarette looks so different than the e-cigarette in terms of aerosol? And I said, because they're two totally different things. I mean, so when you, when you burn a cigarette, you're basically taking whole plant material, cigarette refined by the tobacco companies, and you are burning it at 1,000 degrees, and you're making 6,000 chemicals. When you take an e-cigarette, you're taking four chemicals, really, well, four chemical groups. You're taking propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, nicotine, and flavorings, and you're heating it at about 350 degrees. And so the wound healing impairment is the increased carbon monoxide, theoretically, and the decreased platelet aggregation that comes with smoking tobacco. And a lot of that impact of tobacco is related to tar um, and also related to you know, decreased gas exchange. Because we know that carbon monoxide levels go up when you smoke cigarettes. Where does carbon monoxide come from when you smoke a cigarette? It comes from incomplete combustion. You don't have enough oxygen around to bind with the uh, carbon, so you get carbon monoxide instead of dioxide. So when you do that, um, that impairs wound healing and then decrease, de decrease uh, platelet aggregation. So, so e-cigarettes and vaping are not known to be associated or prevent wound healing, and CBD has not been shown to prevent wound healing. So I refer to the individuals as pharmacists, but what are their qualifications? So they are called pharmacists, um, and uh, I actually don't know um, what Maybe the contract that they have is with the state. Um, um, I do know um, that uh, they are, that many times, you know, they're very free in sharing their own personal use and what's worked for them. I've heard from my patients. I don't know if that makes you a pharmacist or not. I don't really know much about the contract or, or how that's structured. So great question. But I, unless, if someone knows, please email me and you can let me know. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, I think that was it for questions.